So it's a huge pleasure of mine to welcome you to this special session in mechanobiology and how to drive the insights in this rapidly growing field of mechanobiology towards the clinic. Um, my name is Viola Vogel. I will chair the session today. I am faculty in the Department of Health Sciences and Technology at ETH Zurich. And I have the pleasure to give the first talk. We have uh, altogether four talks. All of them will be 15 minutes long. And at the end, we have uh, an extended question and answer session for all of us sitting here in the front. If you have any questions um, on Zoom towards our um, sessions, the session, please uh, uh, send us comments, and we will read them later on in the question and answer session. So the huge field of mechanobiology would have been impossible without the exqui exquisite tools that were developed in the nanotech community. And it's these tools that made mechanobiology possible. These tools allowed to measure tiny, tiny forces, uh, to confine cells, to engineer their environment, to see how cells respond to topography and to many other engineered features. And only with that could it be established that physical uh, uh, factors really matter. Cells do not just respond to biochemical cues in their environment, but the physical properties of their environment are sensed by cells and can, uh, in very concise ways, um, uh, dictate cell fate decisions as well. Many of us try to engineer or to understand cell niches. In cell niches are very organ specific and, uh, and the goal is for engineers to learn how to engineer cell niches with great precision. So what we certainly know, and this is a very nice uh, review from Fiona Watts, that cell niches are composed of many different cell types. They communicate by being in close physical contact. They communicate with a range of biochemical cues that they secrete. But also, um, they respond to the extracellular matrix that surrounds them and to a range of physical cues. In the list here of the physical cues, you see, though, that the factors uh, are listed that we could engineer with precision. So we could engineer cantilevers or materials with defined spring constants. We could easily quantify the effect of shear forces or engineer uh, topographies with shapes and certain features. Then in the extracellular matrix, you see essentially a list of matrix components. But, um, is there something more that should be added to this list in order for us to understand um, cells in their specific niches? When it comes to physical factors, cancer is probably the best at the disease studied best with nanotech tools. We know that um, um, physical factors uh, matter, uh, that uh, the stiffness of a stroma uh, correlates with the with uh, malignancy. Um, many papers have demonstrated that the physics of cancer needs to be considered. However, if you think about stiffness, um, many factors can contribute to increased stroma stiffness. And that includes uh, ECM fiber cross-linking, um, the force-generated bundling of ECM fibers, the enhanced ECM production that is observed in cancer stroma or in fibrosis, um, but also then the buildup of solid stresses by the fact that cells divide. They need space in order to divide, which increases the local pressure on all cells involved and many other factors. In the field of cancer, a huge focus is on killing cancer cells. And most of our therapies aim at killing the cancer cells. But 
the way of how our research proceeded was that in many, many publications, um, the extracellular matrix that surrounds the cells has been forgotten. And that is uh, like you describe a spider and its behavior with, by neglecting the spider net. You need to consider the reciprocal crosstalk between a spider and its net, between a cell and its extracellular matrix. And as the cells are sitting, now I can't activate that video, as the cells are sitting in their extracellular matrix, they pull on fibers, let go, they pull on fibers and let go. They pull on the fibers, let go. So by pulling, they stretch the fibers and let go. So if you primarily focus on killing cancer cells, you leave a potentially diseased extracellular matrix behind. What might be the consequences of doing so? In the physics of cancer, in the physics and in mechanobiology, uh, for um, bioengineers, the focus has mostly been on quantifying the Young's modulus of an environment, for example, by indentation um, uh, to quantify material properties. And it is thought that the Young's modulus of the environment dictates cell behavior. But is there something more to it? Because this and I call it the engineer's view because it considers all the things that we could quantify and engineer easily, assumes that once the viscoelastic properties of extracellular matrix are properly matched, that we therefore match quite well the features of <coughs> extracellular matrix. Cells evidently feel the viscoelastic properties of their environment but is there more to the story that we should be aware of? We know since uh, 20 years that cells can pull on proteins, they can partially unfold proteins as they pull on proteins. And the question is, do the mechanical forces that cells exert change the structure function relationship of proteins? If this is the case, then by pulling on a protein, you can change the functionality of a protein. However, keep in mind that most drugs that we are um, utilizing today in the clinic, they got screened against equilibrium structures of proteins. But if you can stretch proteins, you can change the exposure of binding sites. You might open up cryptic binding sites. Um, you, with that, might change um, the binding of growth factors and cytokines to the extracellular matrix. Um, you might alter enzymatic cleavage sites. You might make them more accessible by stretching fibers. Uh, you might have an impact on how um, the hierarchical assembly of extracellular matrix is progressing and many other features. And if this is the case, um, then certainly many other biochemical signaling that the cell adjusts by applying force to its environment, uh, feeding back um, and contribute to the reciprocal crosstalk between cells and um, their environment. So with that, a uh, protein fiber has not just viscoelastic properties, but the chemistry of this fiber is changing as, the, as cells are pulling on the fiber. Why is this significant? Fibonectin, a protein that we all deal with, it's the first protein that absorbs to surfaces if we implant them. Um, it promotes cell adhesion, but it has many binding sites for proteins of the extracellular matrix. It has the cell adhesion site. It has many uh, binding sites for growth factors and cytokines and many more. So if a protein can be stretched and partially unfolded, you expect that many of these binding sites are altered. They could be destroyed or they could be activated. But which of these binding sites are destroyed by forces? Which of them are activated? 
And how does the cell take advantage of this beautiful feature? So in order to study that, we started preparing stretch assays where we pull fibronectin fibers out of droplets, we deposit them on stretchable substrates, and with that we can conduct binding assays for a range of different proteins. And what we found so far is that certain monoclonal antibody binding sites can be destroyed if you stretch fibers. For example, if you have an epitope that binds between, that bind, an antibody that binds two domains at the same time, if you increase the distance of uh, these domains towards each other by stretching, this epitope will be destroyed. Similarly, um, we learned that the stretching of fibronectin fibers destroys the uh, collagen binding domain. Um, we could show uh, now for the first cytokine in the case of IL-7 that IL-7 binds more potently to stretch than to relax matrices. This is highly significant because IL-7 is needed by immune cells to promote the maturation and is more potent in the matrix-bound state than a free in solution. So IL-7 availability to immune cells is regulated by the tension of fibronectin fibers. And we now most recently also can show that the binding of tissue transglutaminase um, is regulated by mechanical forces. It binds, in contrast to IL-7, better to relaxed than to stretch fibers. In order to learn the importance of fiber stretching at the organ level, we need probes to measure the tension of fibers in tissues. So far, there are no probes to either measure the force cells apply at the tissue level, nor the tension of tissue fibers. So we were asking, can we develop a probe to measure fiber tension at the tissue level? And we took advantage of bacterial adhesins. We discovered that the bacterial adhesin that S. aureus, for example, utilizes to not only detect wound sites, but to enter the host, is regulated by mechanical forces. So the adhesin binds with high affinity to enzymatically or mechanically cleaved fibers. Therefore, you can utilize the peptide to target not just the protein of interest, like what you do with antibodies, but to target the physical state of that protein as well. And we initially showed that by steered molecular dynamics. So you see if we stretch a fibronectin, shown there in gray, um, the multivalent binding motif is destroyed. And so you switch the binding of these peptides from high affinity, high affinity being as high as that of monoclonal antibodies to low affinity. So in the last few years, we developed this peptide into a probe to measure fiber tension at the tissue level. Um, we sliced up many healthy organs. We discovered that fibronectin fibers are held under high tension, under homeostasis in healthy organs. But then if we slice up tumor tissues, we see that a lot of relaxed fibers accumulate there. That was a surprise because people automatically thought um, stiffer stroma, the fibers should be more stretched. This does not apply to fibronectin fibers. We see in the proximity of fibronectin fibers that are structurally relaxed, um, that they are in close proximity to collagen fibers, to thick collagen fiber bundles that are seen by second harmonic generation. We also see that these fibers are in close proximity to alpha smooth muscle actin cells. So to speed up, um, we confirmed that on many other tumors, we then sliced up and analyzed in great detail um, tumor matrices on where the community in mouse tissues has described the presence of ECM tracts. Um, we found that these ECM tracts are not only contain collagen and fibronectin, but a lot of structurally relaxed fibronectin. 
we see that these uh, tumor tracts that have been described are ex actually channels surrounded by basement membrane, and that they are filled by immune cells. And the, that these immune cells consist of M2 macrophages and CD8 um, plus uh, T cells. Um, we further concluded out of these studies that they have endothelial and not epithelial origin. So we, con uh, we are confirmed now that we see a structurally relaxed fibronectin also in human breast cancer tissue. And then we can radiolabel this peptide injected into mice, and it also homes into tumor tissues. So we are very, very excited to have a probe that we can utilize in the future for diagnostic and therapeutic applications. With that, um, we need to understand the reciprocal crosstalk of cells with the extracellular matrix. And I would like to greatly thank all the many uh, uh, collaborators we had over the years already on this project, our clinical collaborators, and you for your attention. Thank you.